Hello everyone, good afternoon. Welcome once again to another seminar of the Astronomy Department. Today we have the pleasure of having Professor Antonio Montero Dorta with us today. We, we thank Antonio for accepting the invitation to be here with us sharing his work. Antonio got his PhD degree from the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalucía in Spain. And then he worked as a postdoc at the University of Utah in the US. He has been working at the IFUSP as a FAPESP postdoc, and recently he has been appointed as an assistant professor in the Universidad Santa Maria in Chile. And his research fields are um, halo galaxy connections, large scale structure of the universe, observational cosmology, and galaxy evolution. And today he will talk about the inextricable bond between dark matter halos and galaxies. And as usual, I will recommend please to turn off your cameras and your microphones during the presentations. And the um, questions will be done after. So if you have one question, just indicate this in the chat, or the same from the chat in, in the YouTube. So uh, Antonio, whenever you want, you can start sharing your screen. Thank you, Maria. You're welcome. I'll do that right now. Okay. Can you guys see it well? Yes, perfect. Okay. Well, thank you again, Maria. And uh, I want to thank all the organizers for, for this opportunity. Uh, I want to thank also the people who are joining us to get, uh, today. And also Raul Abramo, who, who actually suggested this, uh, this talk. Um, so as, as Maria said, uh, the, um, the title of my talk is The Inextricable Band Between Dark Matter Halos and Galaxies, which is uh, a fairly broad uh, title, as you can see. The reason is that uh, what I'm going to try to do today uh, is to give a little bit of a summary presentation of uh, the main things that I've been working on for the last two years, three years at, uh, at the Instituto de Física, uh, working mostly with Raúl Abramo. Um, and as Maria said, well, I'm moving soon to, uh, uh, to Santiago, uh, uh, where I just got a, a professor position. So I thought it was a, really a good idea to wrap it up and then say, uh, Hasta pronto, at uh, see you soon. So that's what I'm going to try to do. Hopefully, I can do it in time. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk basically about the halo galaxy connection, which is my main field of research. And as you can imagine, in this field, what we are trying to do is, is to establish these relations between the properties of galaxies and the properties of the underlying population of dark matter halos, where they live and where they form. And this connection, of course, takes place in the, con in the cosmological context of the large scale structure of the universe. That is something that I will, I will define uh, momentarily. Um, so last night I put together this little diagram here. Uh, I am aware that sometimes these diagrams are more confusing than they are uh, actually um, explanatory, but uh, I think this one in particular emphasizes uh, the fact that uh, the halo galaxy connection actually has ramifications into a number of fields and different aspects, really, uh, such as large scale structure, cosmology, uh, galaxy formation and evolution, of course, and also, uh, um, also direct measurements of this connection, people who are actually trying to, to measure the properties of halos in observations, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm going to basically talk about this you know, different projects that are related to these different aspects in the field. Um, okay, so here's, here's a little outline of my talk. Um, I'm going to start with a little introduction. Uh, mostly going to talk about the uh, uh, large scale structure, which I assume, I suppose, is the, maybe the part that it's, most of the people in the audience are, are less familiar with. And then I'm going to talk about different projects that we did uh, that address different questions, fundamental questions in the field, as these that I'm showing here. Uh, the last one is, uh, can you, can, do we think that the halo galaxy connection can help us improve our cosmological constraints? I already gonna say yes, because I anticipate that maybe I'm not gonna have time to get that far uh, in the talk, but I'm gonna try. 
Um, okay, so let's start. So let's start with the introduction. Uh, I'm going to talk about the large scale structure of the universe, uh, but mostly I want to talk it uh, talk about it in terms of uh, the different layers, the different elements uh, in the uh, large scale structure of the universe that we are trying to connect at the end. Um, and the first one is the, the basic one, uh, which is the underlying matter density field. That is a basically a continuous density field made of mostly dark matter, as we all know, that or originates as tiny uh, quantum fluctuations in the early universe. These fluctuations then expand it uh, due to a process called inflation. That's what we believe. And then they keep, keep uh, growing the fluctuations. The over densities keep growing kept growing due to gravitational instability, gravitational collapse, right? This growth of structure uh, is supposed to be slowed down by the effect of dark energy at later times, basically. So we can define this density contrast for the fluctuations for the over density that is basically related to a background a density, but that characterizes this, this uh, continuous field. Okay, the second element here, uh, actually, yeah, our dark matter halos, right? These also form a field in a sense. Okay, so these are virialized uh, objects that separated from the expansion of the universe and continue uh, collapsing until they stabilize, basically. Um, so they can be described by internal properties such as uh, their mass, their virial radius, the concentration, etc., And they really form the fundamental units of the large scale structure of the universe. Um, Importantly, as I said before, they do form some kind, uh, kind of like a discrete field as opposed to the dark matter density field. So they are said to be biased tracers of the underlying field. All right, so, uh, so here um, is where we can define a quantity called bias, halo bias, that basically relates the, con the density contrast of halos, this, this discrete field, and the density contrast of the matter, of the underlying matter density field. Uh, so this bias is basically a measure of clustering strength. The higher this bias, the more clustered, the most closely separated these objects are. And it can be computed as uh, usual in, in science and these type of things, using the correlation function of both the halos, both the halos, sorry, and the matter density field. And finally, I don't think I have to introduce this this last one to you to you guys. Uh, this is the uh, the galaxy population, okay? That also forms a discrete field that we all know. You, we can measure their properties using galaxy surveys. We know that galaxies form inside dark matter halos. They need the dark matter halos. The variants do, uh, because otherwise it would be very hard for them to collapse. You know, they need they need these potential wells uh, that help them collapse and form galaxies. Uh, so, uh, in analogy, you can also define this bias for galaxies, which is also a measure of the clustering strength. How clustered, how compact, uh, or how, how uh, closely separated galaxies are. So, these are the elements, some of the elements that we are trying to connect uh, in this field. I hope this, this uh, became clear. Okay, so, and then I have to, I always put this type of a motto or life motif uh, slide. Uh, because this is kind of like the type of research that I want to do. And I always say that it, it basically lies in the interface between galaxy evolution and cosmology. Cosmology, galaxy evolution being here, the San Francisco area, cosmology there, whatever, in South Salido, wherever. Uh, but I'm, I'm there in between the, the Golden Gate uh, because uh, I think it's really important. This, this used to be more original a few, a few years ago. But uh, the, the point here is that cosmology really needs uh, population, galaxy population studies at this point to target well, to target different type of galaxies and to optimize the measurements. And as I just mentioned, galaxy evolution, they obviously cannot be disconnected uh, from dark matter halos, from that large scale structure component, because we know they, or we believe, uh, yeah, we know, I should say, that they form inside these, these objects. Okay, so that's it for a, for a little introduction. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot uh, now a little bit about, um, well, there are several blocks here. The first one is how galaxy properties are connected to halo properties. And I'm, I'm going to talk about a, a couple of papers that uh, we've submitted or uh, published recently. Uh, this part is kind of like, almost like in order to, to illustrate a little bit uh, the type of things that, some of the things that we've doing, we've been doing. Uh, 
Uh, I'm going to talk a lot uh, about hydrodynamical simulations that I'm pretty sure that you guys are, are familiar with, at least some of you. Uh, these are excellent tools to really uh, probe, investigate uh, the physical processes that take place inside uh, halos, right? The, the, the galaxy formation processes. Uh, the nice, uh, the cool thing about this, this particular simulation, Illustrious TNG, that I'm using is that it also adds the cosmological component. It is large enough, there are boxes, particularly one box, that we can actually also measure clustering. We can also study how the properties of galaxies and halos depend, or vice versa, on the clustering. Uh, so this is a very important uh, thing for uh, the type of things that we want to do. And using this simulation, well, I'm showing here, just again, again, just for illustrative purposes, uh, how uh, we know that the galaxy properties are connected to halo properties. Um, so I'm showing here uh, several galaxy properties for central galaxies in their halos as a function of virial mass. But I'm not, not only as a function of virial mass, so I'm actually I'm, I'm, I'm showing color, specific star formation rate, size, and spin, the spin of the stellar component. But I'm also color coding by the formation redshift of the halo being basically the age of the halo. So that the, the redder colors here mean uh, older halos, the younger, uh, the bluer colors mean um, uh, younger halos. So what I'm showing here is that really the, the properties of central galaxies in this case, galaxies in general, depend not only on basic halo properties such as the mass, but even on secondary halo properties such as the age in different ways. Okay, so uh, I want you guys to concentrate on this uh, panel right here, where I'm showing the size of central galaxies as a function of virial mass, the mass of the halo, and again, color coded by formation uh, redshift. This is on Illustris again. Uh, so I'm showing this because I'm going to show in, this, uh, in, a, in a, uh, a few slides now how we can actually measure this from observations, which is really at the end the, the cool stuff. Um, to do that, we actually worked with uh, uh, my friend Facundo Rodriguez from Argentina, from Cordoba. Uh, he's a postdoc there. And uh, he's got a method, he's got a, what is called a group finder uh, methodology to identify clusters and groups of galaxies, groups of galaxies, sorry, uh, in observational data. Uh, I'm not going to go into the technicalities here, but what we did was to apply his method that is based on friend of friends. And, uh, and other um, and a halo based method that allow he allow him to actually assign halo masses to to his groups so we applied this to to the SDSS main galaxy uh, sample right that you guys know well uh, the other important thing is that we wanted to study here satellites and central galaxies separately we wanted to study the scaling relation uh, uh, for for centrals and satellite galaxies separately so we impose this criterion here so that centrals are the brightest and most massive galaxies in the groups, which is a very, very standard um, uh, criterion. So the first thing that you can think of is, is measuring the stellar mass size relation, right, which has been measured extensively in the literature. This is what I'm showing here, left-hand side, central galaxies, size as a function of stellar mass, right-hand side, the same for satellites, right? And what we can see here is that uh, both measurements are very similar, actually, you know, kind of as expected. We're not really, like, uh, the most stellar mass that you have, you expect that uh, uh, the, the galaxy is going to be larger. And that seems to be independent of the, uh, what we can call the group status uh, in the cluster, right? But we know that uh, these two galaxies, the type of galaxies, if you believe uh, in this classification, they go through different type of physical processes, right? Uh, central galaxies sit at the center of halos. They really benefit from all these gas that they can accrete. Whereas um, satellite galaxies, they are more in falling um, type of objects that uh, go through, suffer more from things like tidal stripping or galaxy harassment. Uh, so what we're looking at, what we are looking at in this paper, uh, well, what we did was to actually measure the halo mass size relation which I think is kind of cool. It's something that you would think is obvious, but it, it hasn't been really shown too much, if anything, if, if it has actually been shown. Uh, um, but we're showing it here on the left-hand side, again, uh, the size of central galaxies as a function of the mass of the, of the halo. 
And the right-hand side would be the size of satellite galaxies as a function of the halo mass, right? Uh, so here you see that the different processes, the different status, a uh, status, sorry, um, you know, uh, manifest themselves in different relations here. For centrals, again, most massive, more massive halos that tend to have the, res the reservoir of gas should be uh, bigger, so they uh, they accrete. Uh, so when when the mass of the the halo is is larger, uh, the size of of the central should be larger too. It does is not uh, such for satellites, uh, which are less connected to their halos in reality, right? These are uh, objects that are accreted more. Uh, interestingly, there's a little bit. Yeah, but now I'm not seeing the. Então é que se eu tiro essa barrinha, é, alguma coisa acontece que eu não consigo. Uh, uh, it, it, it goes out from the presentation, so I think I'm, it's better to leave it there. Okay. 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 Yeah, I cannot. Just one second. Yeah, it's something, there's something weird that goes on when I, all right, let's see now again. Uh, do you see the slide now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Oh, see you again. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know why this happened. Oops. Oh my God. Yeah, sorry about that. So now it's fine, right? Yes. Okay, cool, cool. Um, all right, so so that's the halo mass uh, size relation that I was mentioning. So the, the interesting thing is that there's this little trend here uh, for satellites. Um, and this makes sense also because larger uh, halos, um, probably they are more um, capable of attracting smaller galaxies. So, so really you have this little trend where, where most massive halos tend to have slightly larger uh, satellite galaxies. Anyway, so we did a little bit of a modeling here that I'm not going to go through uh, because it's a little, um, it would take a little uh, more time. Uh, the cool thing is that you can compare that with uh, Illustris. And uh, this is good because when we compared it with Illustris TNG uh, simulation, we, we find a very, very good agreement, agreement uh, qualitatively, you know, as is shown here. So here the um, the green dots, the green dots are the the data, the observational data, and the background is Illustris TNG. So you can see that for uh, you know the relations are 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 quite similar, which is really something that reinforces the validity of the group identification, uh, but also the physical model of Illustris. So this is this is quite nice. We also looked a little bit into tidal stripping. Uh, this is something that we are uh, expecting to affect satellites more. Um, Maybe I can talk about this later. I'm going to go to the next uh, part of the presentation. But this is, was just to give you an idea of, of how these, these galaxy properties connect to halo properties. All right, so um, excuse me. So, this, um, so here's the, the main core of the, the talk. What determines the spatial distribution of halos and galaxies, right? Particularly, I'm going to talk about halos. Um, and there's a few papers that we've uh, published uh, this last year, this year, and last year about this. Um, so I want, so just to get you guys in the right mindset, uh, I want you guys to go back mentally to those uh, few uh, first uh, slides that I showed with basically the dark matter component of the large scale structure of the universe, that its, uh, its units are halos. 
in the left left hand side, and then you have the visible part, uh, which is the galaxy population, right? Um, I'm just going to talk about halos mostly here, uh, but remember that this this concept of bias, higher bias means more clustered, um, and and of course the bias can be computed from the correlation function. It just gives you the excess probability with respect to a homogeneous and clustered distribution of finding two objects at a distant r. So it really tells you how clustered the population of these objects is. All right, so what determines halo clustering? Uh, so um, primarily, halo clustering is determined by halo mass. So if you have two populations of halos, the one that is on average more massive is going to be more tightly clustered. Its bias is going to be higher. This is what I'm showing here on the left, on this plot on the left hand side. This is a typical plot from Jeremy Tinker. You see how, or actually, this is in a different mass is expressed in a different way here, but this is more massive here. So most massive halos have higher bias. You know, this is kind of like the first, the first uh, determinant of of halo bias. Okay, but what happens if we uh, look at this at fixed halo mass? Uh, so this is what is illustrated here. Um, these all are, this is an n-body numerical simulation, only have dark matter. And uh, these are all halos that have the same mass, basically, more or less, uh, within a, uh, a certain bean of mass. But the difference is that uh, the left-hand uh, plot have halos that are older, that have higher concentration, and the right-hand plot uh, features halos that are younger, that have lower concentration. So if you put a little bit of faith here, you'll see that um, that the left-hand uh, plot, in the left-hand plot, the halos are more clustered. They follow better this under, underlying matter density field. Um, and this is basically uh, as, as opposed to this one, right? And this is basically a manifestation of an effect that we've been uh, studying a lot uh, with Raul uh, and also students uh, at the Instituto de Física that is called secondary halo bias. In particular, that effect on age is called halo assembly bias. It means that halos that assemble earlier in the universe that are older are more tightly clustered uh, than halos that form at later time, times when you look at this at fixed halo mass. And, and the bias here we're looking at, at kind of like um, uh, large scales, well, relatively large scales between five and 15 megaparsecs. So this is basically what is explained uh, in this plot that is a little more uh, harder to, to, uh, to describe. Anyways, but this is a good uh, introduction to one of the, another paper that we've been working, we worked on pretty much last year and, and the year before with a student, Gabriela Satopolito, who's now a grad student in John Hopkins University in, US, in the US. Um, so what we did in this paper was actually to measure all these secondary dependencies of halo clustering at high, uh, um, with high signal to noise, higher than previous measurements. This is something that people knew from, you know, or discovered like 15 years ago, but really here we provided a much better measurement of these trends uh, for different internal properties of halo. So this is kind of like a cool thing that the internal properties of halos actually determine in a sense uh, the bias of them, right? So we look at age, spin, concentration, etc. So the way this works is, is that uh, you basically, uh, you have your population of halos and you bin them by mass. This is halo mass here. And then you separate it based on these properties, you know, older, younger, higher spin, lower spin, higher concentration, lower concentration. So that, and then you compute this relative bias between these subsets um, uh, so that if, if this would, was, uh, were equal to one, that would imply no secondary dependence. But as you see here, this is not equal to one. There exists all these dependencies that we could measure uh, here pretty well using several multi-dark M-body simulation boxes. Okay, so in particular, well, just to uh, reinforce this idea, this is a, the assembly bias uh, uh, effect. You know, you have older halos that at fixed halo mass are more highly biased than younger halos, at least for low mass halos. When you go to the high mass end, then the signal really vanishes and you almost have no signal. Uh, so this is something that we studied. I really wanna give you guys a little idea here 
of what can cause this effect, uh, just for, for the sake of being a little complete. Um, so what really causes a uh, low mass halo assembly bias, right? Um, so there's been uh, multiple theories that has been proposed, but I really want to, uh, well, for instance, uh, something called splashback halos, then there are interaction, uh, interactions between halos, and there's also tidal environments, global environments that could produce these type of trends, right? So the commonality here to summarize is that these are all different ways of basically truncating, stopping the accretion history of a subpopulation of halos that live in highly biased, that means high density environments. This is what all these trends uh, wanna do, right? So this population here uh, is a population that must have stopped its accretion um, due to some physical processes that has to occur in highly biased environments, that, that means in highly density environments. So that's what uh, these theor theories try to, try to do. And just to, to give you another, um, glance of this or glimpse of this, uh, this truncation of accretion history. Uh, there's many papers that have associated this with the cosmic web, the location is in the cosmic web. In particular, this paper from Borsikowski uh, is, is pretty illustrative because uh, they do a zoom in simulation of different type of halos that live in different environments, filaments, nodes. And this is something that we can understand easily, right? So if these two halos have the same mass, which is what you need to have in assembly bias, uh, but one lives in a node, the other lives in a filament, you can expect that it is, this one is more prone to, uh, to stall, to, to stop its accretion, sorry, this one, uh, than this one, right? Here you have all the material going into the halo and it's gonna be easier for him to, for it to continue accreting. So it's gonna be younger. Uh, whereas this one has this, this flex, a vertical flux here, there's a privileged direction that might actually make him more prone to stop its accretion, its accretion right? So these type of things, considering that this will live in a, uh, the bias for this one will be higher, this type of thing could explain uh, the trends that I'm, I was showing. Okay, and the other trend, uh, the other uh, trend that I wanna talk about is spin bias, which is something that we have really worked on a lot during the last couple of years. This is the secondary dependence of halo bias on the spin of halos at fixed halo mass. So it's similar, but it's a completely different trend. Uh, so basically these uh, redder colors mean higher spin halos, typically halos that spin faster, and the bluers are halos that typically spin uh, slower. Um, so you see this, this inversion that we detected in this uh, paper from Gabriela uh, that hadn't been shown. Uh, so that above this mass, uh, halos that are more, uh, that spin faster, that have higher spin, are more tightly clustered than the, the lower spin counterparts. But below uh, is the opposite trend, uh, right? And this was something that people did, then this was, actually this result was confirmed later, later, uh, later uh, but uh, nobody really know what was the cause, the cause of, this, of this inversion. Um, until uh, this student came up. Um, uh, so Beatriz Tuch is a, is a master student at uh, the Instituto de Física. And we heard, with her, we actually managed to, to understand what's going on. And we published it in this paper. Uh, so this is, again, this is the, the spin bias signal as a function of redshift with this inversion that happens at different masses as you go to higher redshift. Um, uh, what what uh, particularly Bea realized is that this was due to something called splashback halos. Uh, so these splashback halos, to, to summarize it in a few words, are, are distinct normal halos uh, at a given redshift that previ previously passed through a larger halo. So they were subhalos. This is the equivalent of satellite. Subhalos at a previous time. So they really go through a lot of... Uh, processes like tidal stripping, et cetera. Um, so the, the interesting thing is that once, uh, so uh, Beatriz was able to identify these halos in the simulation and remove them. And once you remove these halos, you really recover what you would expect as the intrinsic signal without this inversion. So that higher spin halos are more tightly clustered always than lower spin halos. And this was a very, very interesting and nice result 
uh, that we got. Um, we also could understand why this happened. Uh, excuse me. And this is because these splashback halos are typically low spin halos. So they, they pertain to, to one of these uh, quartiles here, the, the quartile with the low spin, uh, which is the bluer here. Um, but and they are low mass. But they, since they were recently subhalos, they, they live very near this own, these other massive halos. So these massive halos, we know they live in uh, very highly biased environments, very dense environments. So their bias is high because they are very massive, as I said before. Uh, so what happens with these halos is that they are low spin, but they live close to these massive uh, uh, halos. So they basically share their large scale bias properties. So that's what basically causes the inversion, that you have an, a, a halo that shouldn't have a high bias. It has it unnaturally because it lives close to these very, very massive halos, uh, just in a few, in a few words. Um, uh, then we talked a little, uh, we also studied a little bit the, the physical interpretation of this uh, uh, with, um, with Bea and Raul. And, uh, well, I'm not going to go into details here, but we know that tidal stripping, as I said before, must be a major uh, contributor uh, to the fact that these objects have lower spin, as you would expect. So there are theories that connect these two. So basically, uh, uh, tidal stripping can actually remove the other layers uh, of halos, which typically contain higher angular momentum particles. So that would reduce the lower spin, and that would actually uh, explain what the, why these halo halos have have these, these lower par spin parameters, basically. OK, uh, how much time do, you have, do I have? Uh, 15 minutes more. 15? Yes. Oh, cool. OK. Um, all right, so, so that's enough time, I think. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how we can actually probe uh, this type of secondary halo clustering uh, dependencies with observations, right? These are dependencies at fixed halo mass, as I've shown. <clears throat> and we've also looked into this in a couple of papers that were either published or, or submitted this year. Um, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm showing this, this uh, slide again. This is uh, Celeste Artale, who's uh, one of my main collaborators who, who works in um, Illustris. And remember, well, I showed this, this slide before, uh, the thing is that uh, we can look at the predictions for, from hydrodynamical simulations, and they actually tell us that these type of secondary dependencies uh, should manifest themselves when we actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, collect uh, the galaxy population using different galaxy properties. So these are the same type of plots that I showed before with the relative bias of different populations of galaxies and halos, uh, where actually now it's galaxies. So the lighter colors are galaxies now, the background colors is the halos. So um, just without going into much details, you see here that actually we can more or less reproduce uh, the background trends, the underlying halo trends by just selecting uh, by galaxy properties. So this is something that should, we should be able to see uh, in observations. Um, actually, there's been a lot of people who looked into this in the last, uh, I don't know, 10 years or something, no, maybe five years. I myself have contributed significantly to the confusion um, because it's really a confusing, uh, uh, confusing field. There, there, there have been claims of detections, claims of non-detections, and it's really an open question yet. If we actually can uh, see this type of secondary dependencies uh, using the galaxy population, something that is usually called galaxy assembly bias. Uh, but back to spin bias, which is what I, I wanted to talk about mostly today. Remember, spin bias is a secondary dependence of halo bias at fixed halo mass, right? This is spin here, the spin parameter. Uh, a couple of interesting things in terms of potentially discovering or, or probing this is that the signal is maximal for the most massive halos or clusters, um, as is shown here. So you see that it, it gets to a factor of... Um, factor two or something um, uh, the, in terms of the relative bias, which makes that, that the signal is maximum for the biggest clusters, which are the clusters that are easier to detect. So this gives us an opportunity. Now, how do we probe the uh, halos? How do we probe 
the spin of halos that's that looks like a complicated complicated thing to do and in fact it is uh so again we can ask uh, hydrodynamical simulations ask them for help a little bit that's what we did this is again uh, illustrious tng and what i'm showing here is the angular momentum of the intra cluster intra halo gas as a function of the angular momentum of the dark matter component of the halo or the cluster here and what we found is that even though the the intra cluster gas is by definition um, uh, turbulent uh the 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 gas which is inside the halo is still contains so it still remembers a little bit about the the angular momentum of the gas there's still a quite a good correlation between these two quantities which makes up made us think that maybe if we can probe the gas inside the clusters inside the halos uh, or, or at least the angular momentum we can we can actually be probing probing uh the dark matter component of the angular momentum all right so uh with raul um uh, excuse me uh we thought about this little probe using what is called the suny f soldovich effect that maybe some of you have heard before uh this is a, a very simple effect um this is basically the interaction uh between uh the c and the photo photons from the cosmic microwave microwave background the cmb which are low energy they are cold um you know the cmb is cold um uh, so it's the interaction interaction between those photons and the ionized uh, gas the electrons inside the clusters and this uh this interaction interaction uh happens in the form of what is called inverse uh, compton inverse compton scattering uh which is basically the type of scattering where um the photon is low and uh, has low energy and the electron is highly ener energetic so what it does is that it kicks the uh, the electron kicks uh, produces a boost in the energy of the photon uh that basically produce, produces a fluctuation or i should say um what's the word uh distortion basically of the cmb map in the direction of of basically the clusters and these have two main flavors uh there's a thermal sunya soldovich effect and a kinetic sunya soldovich effect uh this the thermal effect is caused by the basically the temperature of the electron electrons inside the cluster the random motions of the electrons inside the clusters uh, it can be computed this way. These are basically these distortions of the temperature of the CMB. Whereas the kinetic Sunyaev-Soldovich effect is caused by the bulk velocity of the cluster. So those electrons uh, in the clusters are moving, and that produces a sort of uh, Doppler effect that produces these this, uh, fluctu not fluctuations, but um, yeah, this type of fluctuations in the uh in the cmb mass that in principle should be detected uh, should be we should be able to detect sorry um so what we thought was that we could maybe use this as a probe for spin bias right uh so the thing is that uh of course in this effect um so basically it's going to trace primarily the velocity uh, the uh, peculiar velocity of the cluster the cluster is moving uh so that's basically the main component of the velocity but if you were able to subtract this velocity somehow or with another independent measurement, uh, the cool thing is that you should be able to see these dipoles, dipoles uh, in the in the basically on the on the in the plane of the detector, basically. Because uh, what you're gonna see, uh, so if we if we if we think that the gas inside the cluster is rotating, you will see the two components. Uh, you will see the um, the component that is uh, receding, uh, moving, and the electrons that are moving away from us, and the one, the ones that are approaching us, uh, moving towards us, right? And that can be demonstrated. We produce this dipole. This is a theoretical representation, of course, but this should be able. We should be able to detect this. Now, uh, just mind uh, that that this is this is still a kind of like a long shot KSC. Class, uh, the KSC effect has not been actually measured yet on individual clusters, but we think, uh, we believe that in the next years, uh, this will be possible. So what we did was kind of like a proof of concept analysis using again, illustrious TNG 300. Um, and this is what I'm showing here. We basically took all the halos in TNG in illustrious 
Um, and uh, this is a different paper with Celeste and Raul and Beatriz. Um, and we measure these dipoles. Uh, basically, you can, you can assume that the line of sight is perpendicular to your cluster, to your halos here. And you, can, you basically have to, to compute this integral. And we, uh, uh, and this was very cool, we saw actually this, the, all these dipoles in, in Illustris for basically 50,000 objects. Not for all of them we actually find a dipole. Uh, but the thing is that this, the, the question is whether this correlates with halo spin. That's what we really wanna, uh, wanna figure out. Uh, so what we did was to actually define two uh, observables here, the two integrated signals. By the way, we also measured the, 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 the thermal effect, which gives you an idea of the total mass of the system. And we define these two integrated signals, basically. So there's no need to go into details. Uh, one for the thermal and one from the kinetic sunia Sudovic effect, right? Uh, so this basically tells you about the strength of the dipole. The bigger the dipole, the, the stronger the dipole, uh, sorry, uh, the, the larger the spin of the, uh, sorry, the larger the angular momentum of the intracluster gas, gas should be. And then we'll see if that actually correlates with dark matter halo spin. Anyway, so these are the integrated signals as a function of the halo mass, sorry, of the mass of the gas and the virial mass of the halo. And here, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, for both the thermal and the kinetic. So what, what I'm showing here is that the thermal effect, effectively, uh, this integrated signal correlates extremely well with the, the total uh, mass in gas in the cluster, particularly for uh, the most massive halos. And it even correlates very well with the total virial mass of the halo, which makes sense, right? So in a sense, because if you have a bigger, more massive dark matter halos, you would expect that it would accrete more gas, so that the total gas mass uh, should be larger too. And this is what we find here. So this is very cool because it really gives us a, a proxy of the virial mass. So what happens now with the kinetic and the angular momentum? This is what I'm showing here. Sorry. So this is this integrated uh, KSC signal as a function of uh, the angular momentum of the gas. You see that it correlates very well with the angular momentum of the gas. And there's a decent correlation, of course. Here, you have to take into account that all the turbulent, turbulent motion of gas inside is going to basically um, uh, you know, make this, this distribution wider. But this was a very good result that we find a correlation with the spin of the halo. Uh, uh, actually, when we defined, uh, actually, we are defining the this LSC here as the, the ratio between the, uh, the KSC signal, integrated signal, and the thermal integrated signal. Just in analogy to what is the spin parameter, which is basically angular momentum divided by virial mass, basically. So if you do it uh, well, uh, interestingly, you find this correlation. This was a very, very good result. So what we did was to, to use now, instead of using the spin of halos, uh, we are using these, um, these statistics to split our population of, of halos in illustrious CNG and compute this spin bias and, and uh, measurement, right? This is, so this is, again, the relative bias as a function of virial mass. And now the dots and stars uh, that we show here are basically sp splitting by this observable. This is now an observable, something that we can observe uh, from halos, right? Uh, from clusters. And you see that it follows very, very well, quite well. These are statistical errors still because the box is not that big, but it really follows well, well the spin bias uh, trend. And here actually what we did, we, we, we went a step further and, and we basically um, uh, replaced virial mass by the uh, thermal Sunia Soldovich integrated signal that is a good proxy for for halo mass. And you see that we really find a signal here. So this is uh, basically a very, uh, I think it's a proof of concept analysis that this is something that can be measured in upcoming years, not yet. Um, but there's a number of, of, of different experiments that are expected to provide in the future samples, large samples of KSC uh, clusters of the orders of hundreds of thousands of objects. So with that, we would really 
probe this this with observation. By the way, Chile, where I'm going, is a particularly good place uh, to do this this type of things. Um, and I guess I'm I'm out of time. Is that correct? No, you you have more minutes. You don't need to publish. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna just briefly go through the last part of my talk, which is uh, whether this Halo Galaxy connection can help us improve the extraction of cosmological information from galaxy surveys. This is kind of like the last part of all this study. Um, I'm gonna go through quickly here. This is really where Raul uh, is it's a world expert on this multi-tracer cosmology. That is just in a few words. It's based on the fact that different tracers of the large scale structure of the universe, different galaxies, different populations, they end up tracing obviously the same underlying matter density field because there's only one really. So they all trace the same the same one. So here, uh, actually, the, the, the motivation to put in these slides is to emphasize that understanding uh, how properties uh, how the, the properties of galaxies and halos are related and related also to their clustering properties is, is important also for cosmology because in cosmology what you try to do is to measure uh, here is in terms of the power spectrum, but it's basically similar to the correlation function. But you measure the clustering of galaxies, and from that, you want to infer uh, things about the, the clustering of the underlying matter density field that is related to the cosmological parameters. Anyway, so Raul is an expert on this. He, he developed this multi-tracer opti optimal estimator. Uh, what, that, what it does basically, um, is to combine uh, different clustering uh, information from, from different tracers of the large-scale structure that could be red galaxies, blue galaxies, massive galaxies, low-mass galaxies, combine them together in a clever way to improve the signal-to-noise of our cosmological measurements in just a nutshell. Uh, this is what we did for Vipers uh, using mock catalogs. We showed actually um, it's the bottom line here. We do show that we did show that the uh, uh, that this method actually provides improvements with respect to the standard method that is called FKP. And uh, now Francisco Mayon is also doing a great job. He's kind of like taking this analysis that I did with Raúl to the next level, uh, because here we basically use mock catalogs. He's using real data, and he's actually interested in constraining the linear matter growth rate. That is the the uh, the rate of of growth. Uh, oh, sorry, of um, structure formation in the universe. So this is something that we think this code or this method can help with uh, using this Vipers survey between Redshift 0.5 and Redshift 0.9. Uh, so, anyways, just this is just to emphasize a really uh, Halo Galaxy connection really ramifies into or has ramifications into different fields, not only galaxy evolution and formation, but also also cosmology. And the last, last, last thing that I want to say, almost as a miscellaneous uh, slide, is that there's also a modeling of the Halo Galaxy connection that we've been working on, and particularly, after, well, both, all of us have been working on. It's a couple of papers that, uh, there's a paper that I'm, I'm working on with uh, Ginevra Favole from, uh, who works in, in Lausanne in Switzerland. Uh, but I really wanted to, um, to um, advertise this work by uh, Natalie Desanti, and Natalia Villanova, uh, who are students at uh, the Instituto de Física. And this is actually probably closer to what people are doing in the department. I didn't have time to talk about it. And they are actually the experts on this. But a co very cool thing is that we can use machine learning uh, to constrain the Halo Galaxy connection uh, using Elastris. Um, and um, and this, is actually, this is actually where the field is going to, obviously, as many other fields. Uh, and we can use it to, to generate future high fidelity uh, mock catalogs for, for a number of surveys. So they're really doing a great job. This is something that probably at some point it would be nice to talk to uh, Laerte and some other people about uh, because it's really something very promising. Anyway, so that's I'm going to just leave the take home message uh, here. Galaxy evolution and cosmology need each other. Uh, then I show that central and satellite galaxies have different halo mass relations. Um, uh, well, the other part that I actually don't mention too much. Uh, almost all halo properties at fixed halo mass display some level of secondary halo bias. 
Assembly bias seems to originate from environmental effects related to the cosmic web. Um, splashbacks are also important. Among other effects, they cause the inversion of the spin bias signal. I talked to you guys about the Sunni Hasseldov effect, effect, which we think is it could be a potential observational probe for spin bias. And finally, understanding the halo galaxy connection can really help improve our cosmological constraints. So that's all for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your talk. Thank, thank you. you. Should yeah. I start sharing? No, not yet, I guess. Okay, I have a, a, a small question from a completely outsider of, of, of this subject. You mentioned that the effect of Sunayat Saldovic would be uh, observable or you expect to be detectable, but uh, at, this would be at radio uh, wavelengths. Yes, yeah, yeah, sub millimeters, sub millimeters, actually. With a radio telescope, you, were, you should be able to, uh, to measure it in the future. So far, the, the instruments uh, don't really have enough sensitivity for the, the amplitude of these effects mm -hmm. and also the spatial resolution to measure these. So you have to really see this uh, dipole, right? Okay. So you need a combination of both. Uh, so the things that we have so far are not capable. As I said, there's only, I think, one or two claims of KSC. The other problem is that we have is we need a large sample, right? Mm -hmm. And with one, we cannot really do anything. Uh, but the idea is that in, in the next decade or something, next years, with all this, there's a number of experiments that are going to address these, uh, both uh, spatial, uh, sorry, both from the space and, and from the ground so mm -hmm. yeah to be able to do it right so questions who would like to so i i have a, uh, two very short questions i, I can make just one uh, first uh, uh, thank you antonio for this extremely rich talk and uh, i i have a small doubt in slide 40 when you uh, showed the correlation between the angular momentum of the, the dark matter and the gas in the intracluster medium. And you mentioned uh, that it could be some memory effect, but I, I, I think even if it, they are not correlated initially, dynamically they will uh, follow each other, right? So I, I am correct. I think that, yeah, it was a way of saying it. Because Exchange of angular momentum between. Yes, yes. I guess there's the two, the two effects, right? So maybe they could, since you know you have going to have this gas that is accreted by because of the dark matter potential. Uh, but also, yeah, you, it could be a, a later on effect. Uh, yeah, maybe I should just said that it is correlated mm -hmm. inside the fact that there's a, there is turbulent motion there. Mm -hmm. so we find this correlation. Yeah. And another, uh, it's a very short question also about the kinetic Sonayev-Zeldovich effect. Yeah. I think you showed some esti estimates in the slide 43. It's some effect uh, of the order of 10. I think the previous slide, sorry. Uh, I, I think the relative effect in the temperatures of the order 10 to minus 11. So yeah. uh, you say in the next years, it's going to be possible to test uh, maybe with the next generation of equipment to have this sensibility. Yeah. Actually, this. Uh... This 10 to the minus 11 in this plot looks a little too small, and I think it is because this is for a small halo, actually. Oh, okay, it's going to be. Yeah, I, I am almost 100% sure that this is for kind of like a galaxy halo, almost, you know? Um, this is way too small, uh, I think, to be detected. You need to me a board. What? Uh, I think it was not. Ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, thanks. Yeah. Betty, would you like to ask your question? Oh, hi, uh, Antonio. Uh, yeah. Excellent talk. Thanks. But yes, my question was exactly in this line regarding the hydrodynamical effects uh, 
and in the spinning uh, bias mm -hmm. that you mentioned, because first you based your results and the, 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 the correlations of low mass and large mass, uh, those results in, in the distribution uh, maps that you, sh that you showed, those were based uh, on simulations that were anybody's simulations. Then you invoked this effect, this bias effect, and this, uh, you know, this gas uh, correlation, you know, in order to explain the spin and, and, and uh, no. the secondary effects. And I was wondering um, uh, when the, the anybody, sim because, you know, the hydrodynamical simulations do have taken into account the, the gas effect, and therefore you can explain these secondary effects that you mentioned, right? But on the other hand, the initial results that you showed were only based on anybody simulation. So, you know, uh, I was wondering if there were any inconsistency in this uh, in this point. Yeah. So the spin bias, halo spin bias, that's um, that's really something that you measure for dark matter only in end body simulations because that's that's the tool that we have really. Uh, obviously, you cannot measure it in observations, right? Um, then the hydrodynamical part. Um, uh, where you have the variance. The idea is uh, in the hydrodynamical part, you have the variance, and that's something that we can actually observe in the form of galaxies or intracluster gas. So the hydrodynamical part, it is explained uh, or shown in order to, to actually address or in order to assess whether we can use the variance to actually trace the dark matter halo effects. Um, so it's not really, you see what I mean? So really the effect is in the halos. Uh, so when you look at the halos uh, in an n-body simulation, you see the secondary dependencies of the bias, right? The question is whether we can actually measure this with observations, because we cannot really observe easily the halos. That's when the hydrodynamical simulation kicks in, uh, because maybe we can use uh, them to basically um, to infer or to assess whether you know these trends on the halos can actually be measured or not. I don't know if it remain clear, uh, but they're like different different things, really. Um, yes, that that that's for sure. Yeah. Just... Okay, Paramita, would you like to ask your question? Yes, I think you just uh, mentioned what I was going to ask, like one one part of it at least. So I was wondering, like, how is a halo defined in observations? Because I think you uh, showed some plots about comparing simulation and observation of some halo properties, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, so a, my conceptual question is, how is a a dark matter halo defined in, or how do we find a dark matter halo in observations? Yeah, it's obviously hard to define, that's for sure. We don't, we don't see it really. We only can measure, as you know, the gravitational effect that dark matter has in, in a number of, in different observations, really. Uh, so it's, yeah, of course, in, in n body simulation, you can define a virial radius uh, easily, right, in terms of an overdensity. Uh, that's harder to do, of course, uh, in observation. So that's always uh, a problem. People do this abundance matching things. For but it depends on the model that we are uh, that we are adapting. So in a sense, uh, because I myself work on hydrodynamical simulations, uh -huh. and I know about the semi-analytical model. But I guess in the abundance matching, we do adapt some model in in the observation in order to define a halo. Yeah, there's always, there's, there is some modeling going on. Yes, yes, for sure. Uh, but see, for instance, in the first uh, results that I show, right? Uh, see, when, when, I, when I plotted the, uh, the size of galaxies as a function of halo mass, right? Uh, you see that the way that we're, we were defining it there, that's simply a, uh, through abundance matching, basically. Uh, but it was very consistent at the end, the results that we found. So that's kind of like, uh, um, 
reinforcing of, of, of the fact that this type of mesh, uh, you know, models actually work. Uh, now, for instance, for the Sunia Soldovich effect, um, that's, um, yeah, that's an interesting question. How do you really know uh, what you're measuring in the, the hydrodynamical simulation to establish this connection, right, uh, between the, the, the gas and the dark matter? But we're not going to have really such a good measurement uh, in simulations. Uh, I guess we could use weak lensing as well, these type of things, like com combined with other other measurements. Other, you know? yes. Yeah, I guess weak, weak lensing could, could probably be the thing. For an individual object, you could use uh, strong lensing, of course, uh, but that's that's very expensive for, for 1,000 objects. Is mm -hmm. uh, but it's a good point, it's a good point. Okay. Okay, I also have like one short, uh, small question, second yeah. question. So you uh, basically showed the properties of the large scale uh, structure. So can you also try to correlate with galaxy properties, like in the feedback which is going on inside the galaxy? For example, star formation feedback and AGN and classify the galaxies according to these and then see the correlations. And then see the connection with the large scale structure? Yes. Is that the thing with the bias? Sure, sure. That can be done. I haven't done it, but yes. Uh, okay. Yes, because galaxies live in, in the large scale structure, in filaments, etc. So you can correlate these two things to, to try to understand what the effect of the cosmic web is, uh, etc. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But definitely you need the hydro. The hydro. Yes. And we will need the fully hydrodynamic, yes. Yeah, for this in particular, yes. I mean, I guess. Yeah, well, the catalogs, catalogs of the cosmic web, uh, like this young catalog, young et al. 2000 and something, uh, that can tell you more or less if a galaxy is in a filament or not. But yeah, they are, of course, hydrodynamical simulations are, are, are more, either, even, even though they are still a model, but they, they really give you more information about that. But that's something that, that yeah, it can be done or probed at least. Mm -hmm. Thank okay, you. thanks. <laughs> okay, so Professor Laird. Hi. Hi. Not Professor Laird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, very nice talk, uh, uh, Antonio. Many questions came to my mind, but uh, uh, I will start with just a comment because uh, you mentioned it. Actually, Natalie and Natalia, they participate in our group of machine learning that we meet every fortnight. And the Natalie will be the next speaker, oh, speaker oh. actually. No. Yeah. No, it's but, uh, yeah. yeah, I have I have a question about the 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 title of your presentation, the Halo uh, uh, dark matter connection. Yeah. Looking at the many plots you have shown, I noticed that in some of them we can uh, we can see a kind of uh, fiducial mass, something like that, where there occurs a transition. For example, in, in your first slides, at a mass around yes. uh, log uh, m star, uh, log m halo, uh, twelve point five, something like that. We can see a break. It right here? Is that what you're saying? Uh, this could be, but uh, I saw it in another plot, but in several of them. Yeah, yeah, we can note a kind of breaks at different scales. Yeah. My question is, uh, can you say something about the fundamental scale in, in galaxy formation and uh, whether this is related to initial conditions or to the environment? Yeah, so I have a slide actually that I think is related to what you're saying. Uh, let me see if I have it. Hopefully, I put it in this among the 1,000 things that I put. Yeah, I think the closest is this thing, Laerte. This is the stellar to halo mass relation. Uh, so, this is the fraction of stellar mass uh, of the total halo mass, well, divided by the halo mass, right? As a function of halo mass. Uh, so this is one for one scale that actually is very important around 10 to the 12 or something, solar masses for the halo. 
that is very important for galaxy formation, you probably know. Uh, and it's related to the feedback processes that take place inside, inside uh, the halos, inside the galaxy. So below, let's see if I remember, below this, this scale, uh, all these feedback processes like supernovae, stellar winds, etc. Uh, if I remember correctly, they are less efficient. And above this scale is where the AGM feedback kicks, kicks in, um, which is much more efficient in suppressing star formation than, than these other effects, these other feedback effects. So this is for sure a scale that appears in a number of plots. When you, every time that you plot the halo galaxy connection, even if you plot the sizes, uh, you plot the colors as a function or whatever. Uh, every time that you plot a galaxy property and a halo property, you tend to find this something around this scale. Uh, so that's one of them, at least, um, that I can think of on the, from the top of my head. Does that more or less answer your question? Oh, yes, yes. Perfect. It's interesting that uh, we notice different scale, uh, mass scales also, not only this one. This yeah. one was the one I'm, I was referring to because it, uh, it appeared in a plot of the color versus halo mass. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, this is exactly a, a very interesting physical point. Yeah, actually, I have yeah. Just, uh, no, I was going to mention that review from Dwisa Weschner, uh, maybe for, yeah. the students, uh, for the students in the audience, yeah. it's actually pretty good for this because it, it summarizes all these, all these things. Uh, but yeah, there are other scales, that, that's very true. Uh, even in the scaling relations, the scales that you see, the mass scales are different as well. So. Yeah, I mentioned that because this is interesting because they reveal some physical aspect that we don't understand yet. This one in particular is very apparently well understood, but not the others. Not the others. That's why I think uh, it's worth to to mention them. Yes, I would like to to make a point about your result regarding the kinetic uh, synapse-adaptive effect. Uh, I think in the case of clusters, it's difficult to uh, discriminate between rotation and yeah. collapse because uh, both will produce dipoles in the uh, velocity uh, uh, in a velocity plot. And uh, it's not clear for me how you distinguish between them. Anyway, I think that there is a much easier probe of uh, uh, spin bias, that is to look for the orientation of spiral galaxies within the filaments, because we know that there is a, a spin bias there that mm -hmm. can be measured uh, uh, even at high headshifts. I, I know of works at low redshifts where this bias is measured, and uh, uh, even at the, in the cosmos field, at the high headshift, it can be also measured. So it might be interesting to to use your formalism yes. to 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 probe this um, to yes. consider this probe. Also. This is uh, something that people usually ask. Uh, well, in a previous talk that I gave in UPenn. Uh, yes, I think this would be smaller size halos, but indeed, yes, I think the alignments should be correlated with, uh, and this is something that we could measure also in, in Illustris, I think. Um, I don't think it would be too hard, because there we would have the mass of the halo, so we could calibrate it um, and actually, uh, you know, then measure the spin bias. Um, yeah, I guess what I said is, uh, yeah, I guess it works better for, for the most massive clusters, right? You saw that when in the in the correlation plus, when you go to the small mass clusters, the scatter starts be, being too too large. It really is not such a good uh, probe. Uh, but this one that you mentioned could, could help at the low mass end, uh, really. Mm -hmm. Yes. I haven't looked into that, really. But it's something doable with Illustris. I guess it's doable with observations, although you you won't have the the halo mass. That's the, the problem. That um, the KSC and the thermal one it also gives you a measurement of the mass of the halo. That's also good, you know. 
but you could use you know weak, weak lensing or something like that uh, so yeah, yeah or you can use models to calibrate huh? more models yeah so it's a good point yes something that i can definitely look into uh, with elastis thank you sure okay so i think we can close the transmission i think there Richard. is one question by oh, William. sorry sorry it's good William, are you there william are you listening Has not fallen. No. Okay. Okay, Marie. I, I think you can. We can pause. stop the transmission, Richard. Thanks again, you Antonio. Thank you. Yes, I'm going to stop. Okay, thank you. Oh, Antonio. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, thank you for this opportunity again. So, bye bye.